Hello, everyone. My name is Laura Kleffer, and I am the Associate Director for Education for the Center for Acoustics Research and Education, or CARE, here at UNH, the University of New Hampshire. Um, and this is the first uh, first presentation in our seminar series for the fall of 2023. And I failed to hit record on my computer before I introduced our speaker. So I'm going to give her introduction now and then uh, hop right back into the recording from our seminar. So Dr. Lauren Ferguson is an assistant professor in recreation management and policy at the University of New Hampshire. Her research examines the connection between outdoor recreation, human health, and natural environments through ecosystem services and sustainable protected area conservation and management. Ecosystem services can be defined as the benefits natural ecosystems provide to humans. With her work, she studies how different components of ecosystems, such as soundscapes, influence human health and the best practices for managing parks and protected areas so that outdoor recreationists and the broader community can obtain various ecosystem services. Outcomes from her research have implications for protected area managers, health practitioners, and conservation policy. Application of her research can inform sustainable management practices that accomplish the dual mission of providing individuals with access to healthy outdoor recreation opportunities while also conserving healthy ecosystems. And in Lauren's first part of her talk that we failed to, to record, um, she uh, explained that she received her PhD from Penn State. So with now, and now we'll uh, kick right back into uh, where we began recording the seminar. In the national park. I got to go to Yosemite National Park and we did a study on the half dome cables and how many visitors at one time can safely use the cables. Um, so that was my first taste of research and I loved it. But then I had to do some exploring. So I graduated and worked as a backpacking um, and climbing guide in Colorado and then also worked as a manager for a lifestyle brand and then decided to eventually go back to graduate school and got my master's and PhD at Penn State University um, and did a dual degree there with rec park tourism and human dimensions of natural resources in the environment. Um, and there I did both field and lab studies related to soundscapes um, and got to work with federal agencies, including the National Park Service. And I'll talk quite a bit about the Park Service today. So, why soundscapes? When you go to grad school, there are a lot of different things that you can kind of hone in and focus on. And I chose sound. And a lot of people ask why, because it's pretty unique. Um, and it's because I had someone visit my class when I was an undergrad at Colorado State University. And they were from the Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division of the Park Service. And they talked about how they go out into parks across the country and they manage and measure the sounds that you hear in the park. And they do this because they protect sounds the same way that they protect wildlife, they protect water, air, all of those different parts of an ecosystem. And my mind was kind of blown that sound is so important that it's worthy of that type of protection. And I'm a nature lover. Maybe there are some nature lovers in the room. And this kind of resonated with me that being in a quiet place is kind of an important component of getting away and feeling like you're far from your day to day life. Um, and so when I was in grad school, I got opportunities to collect data, both in the field, in parks, um, but then I also managed a lab on campus where we brought people into the lab and had them listen to different sounds and ask them to rate those sounds and look at different experiences that people have when they listen to sounds. So that's how I got here. Um, I'm currently in the second year um, of being tenure track here at the University of New Hampshire. I'm an assistant professor, um, which is a great time. And actually a little bit about my story. I was a lecturer for three years and then had an opportunity to transition into more of a research role. And that was kind of the best case scenario for me because I love research. And so that's why I'm excited to talk about it today. So I've mentioned soundscapes. What are they? The simplest definition is that they're the human perception of the acoustic environment. So all of the different sounds that we hear on a day-to-day -day basis, whether they be natural sounds, maybe an elk bugling, that's a cool sound, um, or water rushing or the wind against your ears, 
but then also the anthropogenic or man-made sounds like cars, motorcycles, airplanes flying overhead. Those are all a part of the soundscape that we experience. And soundscapes are important, yes, in our day-to-day -day lives, but for parks and protected areas, um, they're important for wildlife. And um, good thing I have some um, bioacousticians and people who study wildlife in the room, they know this better than anyone, that this is how they communicate with each other. Um, they need natural sounds or quiet in order to find food, find mates, things like that. It's important for visitors to parks and protected areas. That's an important motivation for why they go to parks. Um, and it's also been shown to be restorative. There are lots of parts about being in nature that are good for us, and that's part of what I study. But sound can help us make us help make us feel better. Um, and then also for cultural and historic parts. There are sounds like the beating of a drum or the whistle from a train that are a part of that historical heritage that's associated with the park itself. And the Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division, which is a part of the National Park Service, um, these are the things that they manage. And this is the re some of the reasons why they have a whole division dedicated to natural sounds. Um, it's also important for policy. So there are policies in place to protect natural soundscapes within national parks themselves. Not all federal agencies have mandates like this, but the Park Service does. So they measure sounds, they measure how it affects wildlife, they measure how it affects visitors to parks, and they're really interested in noise coming from things like transportation, how that impacts wildlife and visitor experiences. And if anyone's been to a national park in the last 10 to even 20 years, um, you know that these are really popular places to visit. And so with lots of people comes lots of noise because you get there on a bus or in a car or if you're wild and crazy on a motorcycle. Um, but then there's also things like air flight tours. People like to see parks from the air. So think about Grand Canyon National Park where it's really popular to take a helicopter flight over the canyon itself. Um, so with the increased visitation to parks, we have increased noise. And so it's becoming kind of more of an important reason for both researchers and park managers to assess noise and natural soundscapes within the parks. So you don't want to hear me talk the entire time. So let's do an activity and also let's, you know, have some time to reflect ourselves on places that we enjoy because of maybe the natural or not so natural sounds there. So what I want you to do is take out your phones. You don't often ask people to do that, but please take out your phones. If you could follow this QR code to a Padlet, and what you're gonna do is click on the prompt and then you can post a photo. And maybe this is a photo that you have in your own library of a place where you think the sounds are pleasing to you or you do a quick Google search and screenshot, um, a place where you find the sounds to be pleasing. And then also find a photo in your library that maybe rep represents a place where the sounds are annoying. Is it working for everyone?
All right, so I can see that people are still working on this, but I'll start talking. Um, but you can keep working on it, I won't judge. And what I'm gonna do is highlight some of these photos and I might ask you a question about them. And if you don't feel like talking about your photo, you can just do a quick pass. Um, and there's, there's no judgment here. Um, so who's, whose photo is this? Ethan, where is this? Top of Mount Shakora. And what kind of sounds did you hear up there? Nothing. And was this your pleasing sound? Yeah. Okay, very cool. So this natural, beautiful space. Whoa, whose photo is this? Will, where is that? And what kinds of sounds are you hearing here? Oh, very cool. Shell. Wow. And what are you hearing there? Oh, so cool. Is this Will again? Is it Maddie? What are you hearing here? It's a good sound. What are you hearing here? Very cool. Birds, frogs, wildlife. Oh, this is cool. Same. Beautiful. Oh yeah, lots of wind this Saturday. Um, I'm assuming there are some waves crashing on the beach here. Let's see some examples of some annoying sounds. We got Disney. <laughs> oh, I can only imagine. This looks like fireworks. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the reason that so many dogs, you know, need safekeeping on the 4th of July. Yeah, <laughs> arcade, <laughs> Chicago, downtown, I'm assuming some traffic sounds, horns beeping, the beep of the angry horn, you know, parking lot, Cloud City, the sound in the airplane, back to the 50th. You guys did great. Really good examples here. Um, what's cool about our perceptions of sound are that they elicit an emotional reaction. Like we can find things like natural sounds like the wind or bird song. Typically, we like those sounds and they make us feel positive. They help us feel a certain way. Um, and then sounds that are annoying like loud traffic or lots of people talking or lots of sounds all together, kind of like at the arcade, they can be annoying and maybe not make us feel as great. Like maybe we feel really overwhelmed or overstimulated in those places. Um, so that's the cool thing about sounds too, is that for us as humans, we have reactions to them. And generally speaking, I need to add um, references to this to make it real nice and fancy for an academic crowd but generally natural sounds increase our cognitive restoration and that's something i'll talk about in a minute but our ability to recover from really hard kind of mental tasks like being in college or teaching at a university things like that um, natural sounds can improve our mood they make us feel better um, they also help promote recovery from stress and that can be like the physical response to stress or an emotional response that we have. Um, and then man-made noises can impair our cognitive performance. And for any of you that have tried to do some really focused work, when you hear lots of people talking or kind of like when we heard all of those rustling sounds outside the door and you were trying to listen to me, um, that could have been difficult. It increases people's annoyance, which they can, then can also lead to a release of stress hormones. So people that are constantly exposed to Anthropogenic noise um, can have things like increased heart rate, um, and then things like that will also lead to increased levels of like heart disease um, or just like general stress and annoyance. 
So I'm going to talk about um, a paper and a project that was done in a lab setting. Um, and essentially, what we wanted to know was, do natural sounds in a national park context promote recovery from a really cognitively depleting task? So what we did is we brought participants, mostly students, at a big university in the Northeast. You know, we always like to keep the university's secret as Penn State. We um, brought students into the lab on campus. We had them do a depletion task. And so for this task, they memorized a nine digit number, answered some questions on a survey, had to recite that back, did that again. So the idea there was that everyone was kind of like at this depleted baseline. And then they listened to either natural or natural sounds with anthropogenic sounds like motorcycles, planes, vehicles, kind of the same sounds you would hear in a noisy park. Um, and they all viewed the same video of Yosemite National Park um, to give people something to look at. And then in order to test their cognitive response, um, we used a backward digit span, so they had to recite numbers back to us. Um, and the higher their score on that task, um, you know, maybe the better they did on that assessment. And what we did find is that natural sounds did promote restoration. So during that time, it was 10 minutes where people were kind of recovering from their depletion task. Um, the individuals that listened to natural sounds recovered faster, did better on their backwards digit span task. Um, and we we're able to give this information back to organizations like the Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division to help them kind of further justify why protect natural sounds and quiet in parks. Um, because they're good for us, um, especially, you know, in this day and age where we're usually really tired um, mentally from just life in general, um, listening to natural sounds can be really helpful. So when you're out walking in the woods, consider taking out the earbuds because there are benefits to looking around at the scenes um, of being in nature and there's a lot of evidence that shows that looking at nature can be helpful but sounds are an important part of that experience so pop out the headphones think about me next time um, and so i mentioned earlier that i'm also interested in managing um, natural sounds in parks themselves. And so I did this project at Grand Teton National Park. And what we're mostly interested in is how our climbers who climb the Grand, which is um, kind of the main, I don't know, highlight of the Grand Tetons, how are they affected by noise that's in the park? Um, and here's a little map to kind of give you some context of Grand Teton National Park. So here's the park itself, um, and here's the Grand. And there's lots of noise around this place that's in federally designated wilderness. And just a little side, um, federally designated wilderness is kind of the highest degree or level of protection for protected areas in the United States. And there are certain characteristics that go along with wilderness, like it should be naturally quiet. Um, you should kind of feel like you're experiencing solitude, things like that. Um, but all of this wilderness is also really close to a major airport that's right in the valley. Um, if any of you have been to Grand Teton National Park, maybe you flew into this airport. I mean, I have too, it's fine. but there's a lot of noise interference that's right there along the Teton range. And then you have two highways um, that are heavily trafficked that are also right there in front of the mountain itself. And so you can really easily hear noise from aircraft and noise from vehicles while you're kind of out in the wilderness. Um, I took this quote from Boyd Evason, who managed a few different national parks um, during his career. And he says, you don't put a toilet in your kitchen or a bench lathe and a power saw in your bedroom. You don't park your car in your living room. In this room of, of home of humankind, the national parks, we're to provide natural quiet. Um, and so 
in order to kind of understand how our visitors experiencing soundscapes in parks, we do something called dose response. And so we'll intercept park visitors and we'll ask them to listen to the sounds around them. And it's a listening exercise that they do for about three minutes. And for each sound that they hear, they rate that sound on a scale, this is a Likert scale, of acceptability. So how acceptable do they find that sound to be in the context of where exactly they are in the park? Um, and at the same time, um, we also measure the sound level um, of the park itself. And we try to kind of pair them close together. So just behind where these visitors are being intercepted and taking a survey is an acoustic recording device that's recording the sounds that they're actually hearing. So it's also fun, time, fun sometimes to see how accurate are people at listening. Um, they are pretty good, I'll say that. Um, but this dose response method allows us to understand what is that human perception of the soundscape, not just what does the acoustic recording device collect. And so in order to get this information from climbers, we had to take two different approaches. I couldn't stop climbers in the middle of their climb and say, hey, what do you hear right now and how do you feel about it? Because, you know, they're doing like really dangerous stuff up there. And so um, I interviewed climbers after they finished their climb on the Grand Teton about the sounds that they heard. Um, and then I also did intercept surveys where I stopped climbers at a few different points along the trail and asked them to do the listening exercise, rate the sounds that they heard. And we also collected you know, the sounds, the, the actual sounds, I call them sometimes, with the recording devices. And I worked with Shan Burson, who used to be the bioacoustician for both Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Parks. And so what we like to do with this data, this isn't like something unique that I developed. This is kind of the Park Service's approach to understanding how people respond to sounds we're plotting the percent time or the amount of the percent of respondents who heard that sound and then the average level of acceptability in how they rate that sound. And so what we generally find are that natural sounds like wind, water, bird song are rated as acceptable and they're heard a lot, which is really cool. And that these anthropogenic sounds like vehicles and aircraft um, are heard, you know, more places than others and generally rated as unacceptable. And something that the Park Service and other parks and protected area managers are thinking about are, do we want to manage for sounds that are neutral, rated as unacceptable, or if we're truly trying to provide these high quality experiences, in a protected area, should we maybe aim for sounds to be rated here, um, you know, a little more acceptable? And then we also asked visitors to rate those sounds on pleasing and annoying. So how do they feel about those sounds? Generally, natural sounds are rated as pleasing. Anthropogenic sounds are rated as annoying. So we're able to give that information back to the park and it's their their decision with how they want to manage for those sounds. Grand Teton National Park can't move the airport. They can't move the highways. But there's evidence that at least letting visitors know that they are going to be hearing those sounds can be helpful. People, if they know they're going to hear those sounds in wilderness, will potentially rate those sounds as more acceptable. So. I also told you that I did qualitative survey or qualitative interviews. I don't, I, this is the only time I've done qualitative research um, and it's really fun. And I paired um, some quotes that we got from visitors with the percent time audible from the acoustic recording devices of the different sounds. And so you hear things like the wind is sickening. I got tired of that sound. So that's one, right, that we usually think, oh, people rate wind as pleasing. Well, I also know from being a climber and climbing the Grand Two that the wind is the worst sound and kind of my least favorite element um, of being up that high. Um, people talking, um, this is something that I'll come back to in other parks, 
but people also get frustrated by hearing so many other visitors talking. Um, and the Grand itself is like a really, really popular climb. You actually have to wait in line, kind of like Everest, but not like as crazy as Everest, but you have to wait in line at certain points, which feels pretty dangerous, but your people get frustrated with hearing other groups climbing. And then um, something about aircraft, um, this person said that it sounded kind of like thunder, and I actually had um, a few different individuals say that it sounded like thunder, um, and it kind of startled them. I actually had one person say they couldn't tell if it was an airplane or an avalanche. Um, they weren't sure what they heard, um, but it was 6.55 in the morning, so it was probably an airplane because that's exactly when they start flying. Um, so yeah. This was great information to give back to the park, um, and they used it to, to manage sounds. Um, so transitioning to another project, I worked with Denali National Park to help them understand overflights and how overflights were impacting visitor experiences on the ground. And so we know from other research that aircraft sounds generally people don't enjoy them while they are hiking or engaging in outdoor recreation in parks. And we wanted to look at maybe some different methods to best inform those thresholds of acceptability. And so this was a really cool project. I worked with um, David Betchkel, who is a bioacoustician, I think for like the whole state of Alaska. And what he was able to do was measure noise in multiple areas of Denali National Park. We, for this project, really heavily focused on more of the front country or developed area of Denali. And um, from those recordings that we had, he clipped just sounds of aircraft. And we created a suite of 36 different audio clips that played different types of propeller aircraft, um, played at different sound levels. Um, and a little bit more context about Denali National Park, um, they experience around 17,000 flights, like um, most of them are flight seeing tours in a summer period. So that's a lot of overflights. Um, so if you're a visitor coming to the park, you're hearing a lot of aircraft going overhead. And um, Denali itself, like Denali the mountain, um, is what people come to see. It's difficult to see, so seeing it from the air is a pretty cool experience, and a lot of visitors are interested in doing something like that. And I'll play for you an audio clip so you get an idea. Right, so if you were a visitor in Denali, you would have listened to that and then rated it on, on that scale of acceptability. So how acceptable do you find that sound to be, you know, in the context of being on a trail in Denali National Park? We then used a cumulative link mix model in order to kind of predict people's reactions to those different audio clips. Um, and then something that David helped me do is he had, um, data from all of the different flight seeing tours and the propagation kind of sound levels that they emit and he was able to plot that onto a landscape scale so we kind of merged the propagation data with the cumulative link data to then see on a landscape scale where our visitor is going to be most impacted by aircraft flight seeing tours. Something that was cool from this cumulative link mix model is it's kind of like logistic regression in that you're creating probabilities for how likely people are to react to different um, sound levels. And what we're able to estimate from this is that 26% of visitors with no interest in taking a flight seeing tour um, would rate an aircraft at 54 decibels, which um, isn't that loud of 
a sound, um, they would rate that as neutral or worse acceptability. And then we, we kind of singled out visitors who had no interest in an aircraft flight seeing tour because we did find significant differences between those visitor groups. And just to be more conservative, we singled out visitors with no interest in a flight seeing tour because as you would kind of predict, people that want to take a flight seeing tour found the aircraft sounds to be a bit more acceptable um, than the people who didn't. And then here is the map that I was talking about. Um, generally, the colors that are darker than this purple are rated as very unacceptable. And so really the majority of the front country area of Denali National Park, we are estimating that visitors will rate that as unacceptable. So we're able to give this information back to the Park Service when they're issuing out contracts for flight seeing tours, they can go back to this in terms of do we want to issue more contracts for flight seeing tours or no, because of how it impacts visitors. So this is good information for them. It's valuable because it's also empirically in some empirical evidence. If they're going to make decisions and how they're going to manage the park, they're able to back that up with this type of data. Um, something that was cool from this project is that we challenge norm theory. So in the social sciences a lot, we assume that visitors to national parks have a norm and that they all kind of assess impacts in nature the same, like crowding or the number of vehicles that they see in a parking lot at one time, they all kind of rate it similarly. But with this, visitors were really different in how they responded to the audio clips, um, which was unique and it kind of challenges that norm theory because we use that norm theory a lot to justify why we make decisions in park management. And so kind of moving forward, it's food for thought of like, make sure you consider that people have different reactions to things. Yeah. All right, you guys sticking with me? Okay, we're taking our adventure over to Muir Woods National Monument in California. It's just outside of San Francisco. Oh, I saw a hand. you like Muir Woods? Oh, you are, yeah, Muir Woods is very cool. Um, and this study was a part of an NSF funded project where we looked at visitors to Muir Woods National Monument, how they respond to um, educational signs that ask people to be quiet while they were in the park. So we looked at how that experience changed their kind of perceptions. Um, and then simultaneously, we looked at birds in Muir Woods National Monument and saw how kind of visitors interacting with birds, how they affected each other, like what was what were what feedback loops were they giving each other? But I chose to do something a little bit different with that same data set. Um, I was curious about what what components about our experience in the national park combined, like what are we hearing and seeing, but then also what about our own kind of you know unique attributes about us affects our perception. And so I had access to a data set that um, estimates the sound level of people's home zip codes across the United States. And so what I looked at was, does your home zip code, like the noise or natural sound that you're exposed to every day, how does that then influence your perception of sound in the park? Um, and so we had data that also measured the soundscape of the park itself. We had 13 different acoustic recording devices um, set throughout kind of the main trail in Muir Woods National Monument. We looked at the number of visitors that were on the trail at that time when visitors did their survey to see if visitor density was a part of something that would impact their perception. And like I said, we had, um, I took the average daytime sound level of visitors' home zip codes to see if that had something to do with their perception of sound in the park. Um, and what I found was that it does influence how they perceive um, the soundscape of the park. It had a small effect though. Something that was more impactful were things like um, your noise sensitivity. So we all have different you know, levels of annoyance when it comes to sound. 
Um, I looked at their motivation for hearing natural sound that had more of an effect. Um, and interestingly enough, the sound level of the park did not have an influence on their perception um, and neither did trail density, the number of visitors on the trail. So those were kind of more um, like obvious things that I thought would have impacted their perception, but it didn't, you know, science is fun. It challenges us all the time. Um, I'm gonna skip this because it's not that fun. But also <laughs> generally what was interesting was that people from, louder home zip codes found the park soundscape to be less pleasing, which I thought, which was the like standout unique thing. And so you're like, what's going on there? That's something future researchers, I don't know if it'll be me, but like, let's tease that apart a little bit. Oh, I'll go back to that then. Um, is it, does it have something to do with our noise sensitivity? Um, what I found here is I just, you know, kind of looked at what is that correlation between noise sensitivity and neighborhood sound level. And generally, as your sensitivity is increasing, your neighborhood sound level is decreasing. So people who lived in quieter places are less sensitive. So is there something going on there? Are we choosing to live in quieter places? Or for some of us, I mean, that's not even a choice. Like, you live where you live because that's where you can afford to live things along those lines. So um, that's just something I found interesting. And also, are we becoming more complacent with the noise that we hear? Even though going to a park is a place where you should experience quiet and natural sounds, hearing things like loudspeakers, people playing music from speakers, people talking loudly, traffic, all of those things, are we just becoming kind of more normalized to that type of sound? Something to tease out in the future, we'll see. Um, and now I wanna talk about some of the research that I'm doing um, currently. So I'm working with um, a group of UNH researchers, um, Dr. Rem Mull, Dr. Laura Klepper, who I got to meet through CARE, and Dr. Karina Sanchez, also part of CARE. Um, and we got together as a team and we are looking at a few different things. And Laura, I know this bat is probably like a vampire bat from South America, but I just, I had to put in a bat because, you know, like a special shout out for Dr. Klepper. Um, but we're looking at a few different things with this study and the study is taking place in College Woods, which is this really cool resource that we have here on campus. And we're measuring visitors' reactions and responses to being in near, not near woods, college woods. And we're looking at things like what are their physical health outcomes? What are some of their mental health outcomes? Are they restored by taking a walk in college woods? Things like that. And we're simultaneously measuring biodiversity. So we're looking at avian, mammal, frog species, um, and you know, bats are mammals, so they're included in that, something I learned, you know, recently. <laughs> um, <laughs> I used to list like mammals, comma, bats. And Lord, no, that's a mammal. I was like, <laughs> noted. Um, we're looking at all of these different things. And um, what we're trying to look at is, is there a relationship between biodiversity and our experiences in parks and protected areas. There are a few papers that say that there's some evidence here. It's not super strong. So we're taking a deep dive to see what is that interaction with biodiversity um, and our experiences. Um, and so we are looking at things like how many species do people think are in college woods um, and what are their experiences in college woods, things like that. Um, we're introducing some other variables into this. We're using an educational intervention. So there's a sign that's in college woods sometimes because it's part of an experiment, but we're seeing if, if we tell people about the biodiversity in college woods, does it change their experience? Um, and then we're also looking at seasons. Typically research that's done on biodiversity and kind of human experiences with biodiversity or reactions are done in the summer or like, you know, during those months when like biodiversity is very obvious. We see all the leaves and the flowers and we hear the bird song, but we're gonna do it for a full calendar year to see if there are changes between the seasons. 
All right, another one. This is a project that I'm doing with Dr. Karina Sanchez. And by the by, I have some researchers here, Raina and Will, who are helping me collect this data and who are doing a great job. Um, but this one is called a phantom chorus because we are creating a phantom chorus of bird song biodiversity along a corridor of Dover Community Trail. And what we're trying to understand is, does that increase in bird song biodiversity influence things like self-reported well-being and also restoration? Like, are people feeling like that's a more restorative soundscape if they're hearing multiple different types of bird song? This is a replication of a study that I was a part of that was conducted in Boulder um, open spaces in Colorado. And that's a very different place than downtown Dover. So this is more of an urban context and um, Dr. Sanchez is an urban ecologist. And so this is, you know, right up her alley. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what's that effect of the phantom chorus. And some of the details with how we're creating that phantom chorus are we're hiding 10 different speakers along this corridor and each speaker is playing a different species. And these are species that you would typically hear if you were in Dover, but um, we're just kind of artificially introducing them to your experience. Um, and the things that we're measuring with visitors are things like their restoration, their emotions, health outcomes, and then of course some sociodemographic information. Some future things that are coming down the pipeline. These are thoughts that I'm having and I'm wanting to share with you and just like put it out into the world to see if there's potential for collaboration or thoughts, things like that. Um, I have a colleague who is the social scientist for Acadia National Park. We've started conversations about like what are some of the soundscape impacts in Acadia, a place if you've been in the last I don't know, 20 years, it's very crowded, very busy, lots of noise. Um, so if there's any interest in that, like let's chat, let's figure something out. Um, and then this upcoming summer, my husband and I have a contract with the US Forest Service. And what we're assessing are wilderness characteristics in the White Mountains. Um, and a part of wilderness characteristics can be things like quietude. Um, and so, Potentially there's a sound component to it. Um, of course, my goal is to like figure out how to get that sound component recognized, um, but there's you know potential there. And then something else I wanna point out is that colleagues that I have at Penn State, um, it's a collaboration between their rec park tourism program and Penn State Acoustics. They have the contract now with the Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division, and they're going to be helping them analyze um, create reports about the different sounds that are being recorded in the different parks across the country. So that's um, a place where I think I see a lot of potential for collaboration because um, that's a lot of data to analyze and, and cool things to tease out there. Um, and then finally, I highlighted some of my collaborations with CARE, but something that really hasn't been touched before, where I think there's really cool potential, are looking at marine parks, national parks, um, and soundscapes, and how people perceive soundscapes in parks um, that are on the water. Most of the time, we're looking at terrestrial parks, um, but there's a lot going on with marine. So um, I think there's some cool potential there. Big takeaways from today, thank you all for being here, um, are that natural soundscapes are important for wildlife and us. Um, and it's important that we experience those natural sounds and quiet and take out, take out the earbuds if you can. I know sometimes they're necessary, but try to take in the natural sounds as much as you can because there are benefits. Um, Biodiversity, you know, we're, researchers are looking at all of these different components. Why is nature good for human health and well being? Well, I think sound for sure is a part of it, but I think biodiversity is too. And that's kind of like one of those awesome, like dual mission um, things to explore because biodiversity is 
you know, something that we're potentially losing. And so if we can promote keeping biodiversity, promoting biodiversity, it's good for the environment, but then it's also potentially good for us and our healthy experiences that we have when we recreate outdoors. Um, I highlighted some cool tool, tools for measuring how we perceive noise and how we kind of react to different sounds. Um, and then finally, care rocks, because of course you all are here. Um, collaboration and interdisciplinary research is kind of key to solving some of these problems and understanding soundscapes. All of the research that I presented today was done with a big team, some teams pretty big. And that's because um, I like to work with researchers from different fields, um, kind of looking at different problems. And so CARE is a great place to meet and collaborate. And so I think we have time for questions and thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, uh, Lauren. We can all say that we learned a lot of things. And thank you for making us reflect on our own, <laughs> like, pleasing sounds. Mm -hmm. So uh, we do have time for questions. I do have to acknowledge that there might be some students that need to get to a class. Because if you need to leave, just get up and leave. It's not being rude. Feel free to get up and leave. Those of you who have questions, um, stay around. So we're going to start with questions in the room. Are there any questions in the room? Danielle. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately I did. Oh yeah. So Danielle is asking um, if we have any qual qualitative data about kind of their access to nature, how often they're accessing nature. Um, and I don't, um, unfortunately, from that study. But I guess you could take a deeper dive with having their zip codes to um, doing some spatial analysis with like how close are they, what is their proximity maybe to, or you wouldn't have that. Or maybe the amount of open space that's in their zip code area maybe some things like that, but I know that access is a huge part of it. Yeah. There's compliments. Yeah. Everybody's doing a quantitative number search. Look at the thing that's really beyond me. Um, Likert this scales. This is a fun question. So there, say there's 20, 30 people in here and you people in mind, would you just exclude 50 or 60 people from your group or study? <laughs> what do you mean? I know, now I know oh, now you know? Um, yes. 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 Mm -hmm. I know. I know. I've excluded you. But you could you could still potentially participate, but maybe not take the survey. Walk the phantom chorus and like think to yourself. I know. <laughs> they do not. <laughs> yeah, Raina knows. <laughs> well, I think we have one question in the chat. Yes. Can I read it out loud, Sally? Yeah. So Jen asked if the main soundscape of your group would involve um, dinosaurs. Keep the question up. So the question was if the marine soundscapes work would include um, interviewing or surveying uh, divers or snorkelers. Um, I think it should. That would be very cool. In general, like when I think about what are the research questions in marine parks, I think we would be interested in understanding all of kind of the outdoor recreationists that are on the, you know, in a marine area, whether they're like on, on the beach or on a boat, what are they doing on that boat? And you would kind of have these different like little sub samples to see what are commonalities amongst them, differences, things like that. Yeah. I have not, but Jen, oh, have we looked at anything with ecotourism? <laughs> Don't walk away from the camera. Um, we haven't specifically, but in general with the National Parks research, 
most of those people are tourists. Oftentimes we do kind of look through the data sets to see if there are people that are local and usually there are like maybe a handful of people that we intercept who are local to that area. Um, so generally they are tourists. Um, if it's if it's an ecotourism experience, hard to say, um, but I haven't yet. Yeah, thank you. Jill. Do you have any sex or gender differences? So the question is, do we find any sex or gender differences? We we typically tease, we typically do just an analysis at the beginning, and so far we haven't. Yeah. Well, this morning I read a paper yeah? that, uh, or the speech sounds at least, like exceptional prominence of mm -hmm. females tend to be uh, at greater statistically exposed. Oh, interesting. Maybe we'll have to go back to it and see. But usually we'll like throw gender into, into a model and it falls out. Or do like a context around it. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. I think we, so with national park visitors specifically, they tend to be somewhat of a homogenous group. Um, and that the age range is typically like 30 to 60. Um, and there isn't, we haven't found like a ton of variation, which I do, which is why I don't think it like is an influencing factor sometimes in measuring perception. Yeah, but that's a good one. Okay, let's make this our very last question. You say as you're also looking at different perceptions, have you started to look at or considered like folks with confidence and challenges in Oh, we have not. Um, however, in a project that I have going on, we're, we're not looking at sounds specifically, but we're looking at how nature experiences impact um, kind of 